WAGP Buford, Hilton Head Island, Savannah, a ministry of Community Bible Church of Buford, on the web at WAGP.net. This is the Bible Line, a live radio call-in program with Dr. Carl Brogy. Dr. Brogy is the senior pastor of Community Bible Church of Buford, South Carolina. And for the next hour, he's available to answer your questions, providing biblical insight and wisdom for everyday Christian living. Our phone lines are open, and if you have a question, you may call 525-1859 locally, or outside the immediate area, call toll-free 877-924-7980. Now let's join Dr. Carl Brogy. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. I welcome you to the Bible Line this uh, Tuesday before Thanksgiving. I know many people are traveling. Maybe you're on Interstate 95 and you've tuned in to us for the first time here at 88.7 FM. For the next hour, we will be taking people's questions about the Bible. Sometimes there's a particular passage someone's struggling with or Maybe they're looking for counsel as it relates to their ministry in their local assembly or in their personal life or family. If we can be of help by God's grace, we'll do our best. How do you reach us? Well, several ways. You can use the toll-free 877 number, and it's just the call letters WAGP980, or you can call us on the 843 South Carolina Exchange, and that number is simply 525-1859. In addition, you can text us directly here into the studio, at not at that number, but you can add TBL for the Bible line at WAGP.net. It's really an email address. And, uh, and again, when you call, you can go on the air live, or if you're more comfortable, you can just dictate your question. We're happy to receive it. We welcome all that are listening for the first time, either at 88.7 FM or through the Internet. We broadcast around the world. I met some Canadian people again this past Sunday, and they're so grateful for our station. You know, there's no Christian radio in Canada, and WAGP uh, serves a vital role, and we uh, broadcast at WAGP.net. Well, with that said, Walter, let's go ahead and we'll begin this morning. All right, Pastor Carl. Our first question comes from Peter out of Webster, Massachusetts. He would like to know, are there prophets today? And he says that his wife listens to two people who say that they have been to heaven. I do not believe that is possible. Am I right in believing this? Well, uh, let's take the first question. In the book of Ephesians, uh, there are four central passages that deal with the subject of spiritual gifts. They're easy to remember, 2.12s, 2.4s, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, and Romans 12. So those are what we would call the central passages The issues are addressed elsewhere, but those are the major portions. In Ephesians 4, it speaks of Christ's ascension, sending the Spirit, but also the sending of gifts. And he gave some, we read in Ephesians 4.11, as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. So when you're dealing with these particular gifts, it's important to make a distinction between the office and the gift. There is the office of apostleship. There are no apostles today because to have seen the risen Christ is impossible, and that was one of the requirements 1 Corinthians 9 indicates to be a true apostle. You had to have been personally selected by him, and in addition, if those two things were true, there would be certain signs and wonders, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, that would accompany uh, that confession that you were indeed a true apostle. With that said, there's also, but by, but I should say, there's also the gift of apostleship. Now, in our English Bible, we tend to uh, distinguish the office from the gift by a different word, but in the Greek New Testament, it's the same word. And so, for instance, Epaphroditus is called an apostolos, an apostle. And in many uh, translations of the Bible, that's what they put, and they leave it up to the uh, reader to discern. Uh, Again, the goal of translation is to try to communicate, and so most English Bibles will say messenger instead of an apostle. Uh, Again, even like the office of deacon, there's a formalized word, diaconist, that describes the office, but in a broad sense, every person is called a deacon who's a follower of Christ. He that would be great among you must be the deacon of all. 
So the Bible does distinguish between office and gift and sometimes office and a role. Here, when you speak of prophets, there's the office of prophets in the, in the Old Testament, and there's a the gift of prophecy. The office of prophet continued for a period of time, uh, but then when the Spirit of God came, uh, you have the gift of prophecy. Now, in terms of prophecy, uh, how would you define it? Well, among other things, it's the ability to communicate the Word of God with authority and with power in a way that brings conviction. Now, understand, remember, the Scripture in the early church was not yet written. Many churches had no New Testament books at all as they began, and, and so for about a decade, they read and studied the Old Testament, or they had prophets who came, or if they were blessed uh, and they had an apostle nearby, they might listen to the preaching of the apostles. Eventually, all those writings and thoughts were codified in, in the 66 books we call the Bible. But in the interim, to fill in some of the gaps, God would have men, and sometimes even a woman, who would stand up with the gift of prophecy. Uh, the closest thing today would be, say, a man or a woman reading Scripture in church, and they would share God's revelation. Uh, this is important to test the spirits to see if they be of God. Uh, but once the canon of Scripture was written and completed, the gift of prophecy, either in terms of giving new revelation or predicting future events like Ag- Agabus, uh, who foretold what Paul was going to encounter when he went to Jerusalem. It didn't matter to Paul. He was going anyway. Um, but there's a difference between that foretelling, say, and forthtelling. So if you define the gift of prophecy as uh, having a foretelling component, then I would say, no, the gift does not exist. If you're defining the gift of prophecy today in terms of its ongoing foretelling dimension, then I would say it does exist. And of course, um, in the simplest sense, it meant to preach. And Paul gives preeminence in 1 Corinthians 14 to the preaching of God's word over some of, the, say, the sign gifts that the Corinthians were enamored with. Um, so there is no new revelation today. And so if someone says, I have the gift of prophecy and I have a word from God and it's uh, in addition or it subtracts from Scripture, then it's not a word from the Lord. And it's really a a misrepresentation. This is what the cults are built on. They have an open canon. They have new revelation that's coming, that's put on the same level and authority as Scripture. Uh, This uh, gentleman, Peter, who's uh, writing us from Webster, Massachusetts, Peter, you might want to consider taking my course called Spiritual Gifts, You can find it at the Institute of Biblical Studies at searchthescriptures.org. And I actually did my doctoral dissertation on the subject of spiritual gifts, and so it's near and dear to me. Your second question is, uh, your wife believes someone died and went to heaven. Well, uh, she's mistaken. I know she means well, but she's mistaken. You might want to listen to a sermon where I referenced this when I preached uh, verse by verse through the book of James. And, and, you know, sadly, this sells. It sells books. Um, you know, some of the most popular books that have been produced in the last 20 years were people who supposedly died and went to heaven. And, of course, I unfolded the error of these. Um, one young man who was six who died supposedly and went to heaven. When he was 18, he was converted, and he told everyone it was a big lie. Oh, the publishers didn't know what to do. Uh, since the book had been produced by his dad and had made the family extremely wealthy, and the publishers, no doubt. Uh, No, the Scripture says it's appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. Uh, When uh, James deals with the subject of faith and works, he says, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So when the spirit leaves the body, the body is dead. It's appointed for man to die once, and then comes the judgment. That's the pattern. There's a few rare exceptions in Scripture where someone dies and they're raised back to life. But the pattern in Scripture, and again, this is important to draw your doctrine from the epistles. There are some things that happen uniquely in the historical books, and they're not normative for believers today. But these people who say, well, I died and went to heaven, they come back. And, of course, most people don't say, I died and went to hell. 
though occasionally you'll hear someone, they all die and go to heaven. And most of these folks who die and go to heaven and they come back and tell their story, uh, it has nothing to do with what Scripture says. In fact, it goes way beyond what Scripture says. And then we're guilty of what God warns at the end of the Revelation. He says, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which were written in this book. And so God is marking those who add or subtract to scriptures basically as unbelievers. And so there's a warning here. I I find it interesting, the great apostle Paul, when he uh, is having an experience of what heaven is like, and it is so real. He says, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body, but it was so moving. God had to give me some kind of physical ailment that I wouldn't brag about it and wouldn't tell about it. Wow. If Paul couldn't tell about this great vision of heaven he had, what makes us think that Burpe can, you know, go to heaven and come back and write all about it? Uh, this is just sheer nonsense, and it's extra revelation. Same problem with the first question concerning prophecy. It goes beyond the bounds of Scripture. But listen to my series on the book of James, and specifically, uh, I, I broke it down, um, James 2, 14 to 26. Go to searchthescriptures.org, type in the search bar, James, listen to that sermon, and I deal with this whole subject of out-of-body experiences, and people have died supposedly and gone to heaven, et cetera, et cetera. Good question from Webster, Mass. Let's go to the next one. All right, Pastor Carl, 843-525-1859. Again, that's 843-525-1859. We're going to go to the phone lines, Pastor Carl. I believe we have Mary Ellen from Beaufort, South Carolina. Good morning, Mary Ellen. You are live with Pastor Carl. What is your question? Good morning. Um, what is the difference between righteous anger versus unrighteous anger, and does lingering anger go hand-in-hand with forgiveness and grace if it's righteous anger? I know there's consequences to sin, but doesn't true forgiveness and grace overcome anger toward the person who did the offense? Otherwise, bitterness toward the person who's apologized would turn into unrighteous anger and give a sense of control over the person who did the offense. And how would you move forward from this? Those are great questions, uh, really, really good questions, Mary Ellen. Uh, let, let me just uh, parenthetically note a couple passages because you're obviously coming with that awareness and not all of our listeners are. In the uh, fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, I've turned there, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. And if you have the New American Standard with um, uh, footnotes, uh, because there's a change in typeset, when there's an Old Testament quotation, they usually indicate that by all caps, and it would bring you to Psalm 4.4, which actually would elucidate this passage even further for you. But let me just say, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. And so there is a righteous anger. Obviously, Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. In him was no sin. He knew no sin. So it's described in different passages that he is indeed the sinless son of God. And yet, obviously, with a righteous zeal, he goes into the temple of God. He overturns the tables. He drives out the money changers. We would say that's righteous anger at work. And there are some things that should make people angry. It should make people angry what Hamas has done in Israel. Uh, And people, you know, seem to ignore it and say, well, you know, really it's the Israelis who are at fault. And and they've done everything in their power to protect civilians and everything else, even uh, incubators for little babies that Hamas turned away and rejected and uh, one thing after another. And yet, You should be angry when you see little children having their hands and feet cut off, where you see women abused, where you see uh, adults beheaded, where you see little children put in ovens and cooked to death. That should make you angry on the inside. That's a righteous anger. The Scripture says, though, we're not to be controlled by anger. 
And so there is a qualification here. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And I'll often use this passage in counseling with couples. And I'll say, look, if you go to bed at the end of the day, back to back, you got a problem. You are giving Satan an opportunity. Don't give the devil an opportunity. And the word opportunity there is a Greek word that means um, a foothold, or you might, it's actually a military term. It means a beachhead. You give Satan a beachhead, a a place of military operations and advantage over your spirit when there is unrepented, uh, unrighteous anger. And so it certainly turns into bitterness and into unrighteous anger when we hold on to it. And how do you know whether you're holding on to it? Well, a couple of things. You've got to ask motivation Uh, What's my motivation and how am I dealing with the fact that maybe someone is dealing unjustly with me? Uh, I think of, for instance, uh, 1 Peter 2 and 3, where the uh, Apostle Peter talks about submission to governments, to bosses, to mates. Um, He speaks about submitting uh, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it's to a king or a governor. Uh, because they have been entrusted by God to punish evil and to praise good. Sadly, there are governments in the world that praise evil, like the one I just mentioned, Hamas, and they put down good. And it's a sad state when people reverse in the height of depravity, good and evil. Woe to you who calls good evil and evil good. Uh, But then he goes on and he reminds us that, you know, we have a responsibility. Remember when he writes this in First Peter 2, Nero is in charge. He didn't like Christians, didn't treat them well at all, but we're still to show honor to the office. I don't like our president who is involved in protecting and propagating transgenderism and homosexuality and the murder of little children in the womb. I don't like that at all. It, it makes me very sad and at times angry but I still have to respect his office. I don't make jokes about our president and his memory issues and things like that. I have to respect the office, and we're called to do that. Then he says, servants, be submissive to your masters with all respects. He says, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor with God, if for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. What credit is there? By the way, Jesus kind of highlights this same truth when he deals with um, those who treat us unjustly in the Sermon on the Mount, and he tells us to love even our enemies. But what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it and patiently endure, this finds favor with God. So sometimes, you know, unrighteous anger is seen and that we're unwilling to suffer when we are in the right. And God tells us to do that. He says anyone can respond in a positive way to someone who's good and gentle and kind. Not everyone can respond to a person who is unkind towards you. And then he says in the next verse, for you've been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps. And if there was ever a person who suffered unjustly, it was Jesus because you couldn't find anything wrong with him. He was absolutely perfect. And Peter highlights that he committed no sin, no deceit was ever found in his mouth. And yet while he was being insulted or reviled, he didn't revile in return, but he entrusted himself. In the same way, chapter 3, wives, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one without a word by their behavior of their wives. So there's a place for a woman to suffer unjustly. I know today, sadly, you know, there are some women who are physically abused, and there we might say that there is a uh, operating uh, principle that God would say your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, so you need to take cover and protection, and it might be uh, leaving the home with the children in that kind of situation. So I'm not advocating some woman suffer unjustly under a wife beater. But look, there are mean mates. And the shoe can be on the other foot, as uh, Peter will underscore. And sometimes there's a need just to suffer unjustly, to follow Christ's example. And he says, here's how you win that unbelieving mate or that person who's out of fellowship with the Lord. And then he'll say, to sum it all up, be harmonious, sympathetic, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil, but 
you know, giving a blessing instead. And so how do we know we have unrighteous anger? Well, we're unwilling to suffer unjustly. We're not willing to follow Christ's example. We are returning insult for insult instead of returning with a blessing. Or the other parallel passage that I would point you to would be the 12th chapter of Romans, where again, in the latter half, after he deals with the subject of spiritual gifts, he deals with relations in the body of Christ. He says, bless those who persecute you. Wow. Uh, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. In verse 17, he'll say, never pay back evil for evil. That would be unrighteous anger, where you're taking revenge. Respect what is right. If possible, so far as depends on you, be at peace with all men. Sometimes it's not possible on the other side, but as much as it depends on you, be at peace. Never take your own revenge. That would be unrighteous anger uh, because vengeance is the Lord. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. What you might want to do is go to my series on Romans because I deal with this subject of unrighteous anger in great detail. Go to searchthescriptures.org if you don't have the phone app. Download it at the App Store so you can listen when you're out in the car or it's just convenient for you, and type in in the search bar Romans, and you want to listen to the message on the second half of Romans that covers verses 17 through 21, where I give an hour-long answer to your question, but I wanted to address it at least on some level today. Great great question. Let's go to the next. All right, 843-525-1859. Again, that is 843-525-1859 if you have a question for Pastor Carl this morning. Our next question comes in as a live dictation, Pastor Carl, from Mitch out of Beaufort, South Carolina. He writes, a couple of weeks ago during a sermon, Pastor Carl referenced the word pharmakia as it relates to street drugs versus legal drugs that a doctor would prescribe. Could Pastor Carl please explain where in the Bible that this is mentioned? Okay, so it's found in the book of Galatians, uh, among other places. Let me just turn there. The exhortation in the context of the paragraph is, I, but I say, walk by the Spirit, that you might not carry out the desire of the flesh. The term flesh, sarks in the Greek New Testament, can refer to the skin that covers your skeleton. It can refer to a worldly point of view. Um, Paul says, we don't regard men after the flesh from the way the world would see them. He said, I even regarded Christ once in that fashion, 2 Corinthians 5, but no longer. Or most often the word sarx or flesh refers to the sin nature within. And so some English Bibles will interpret it with two words. Instead of saying flesh, they'll render it sinful nature. If you're trying to do a word-for-word correspondence, uh, they'll just go with flesh and they'll be consistent all the way through and they leave it up to the reader to do the interpretation. So when they say sinful nature, it's a little more interpretive, but it's correct, at least, in that sense. The problem is, is when you have a translation that does some interpretive work for you, sometimes you miss the thought process that God wants us to work through, or sometimes, again, the interpretation, maybe especially in paraphrased versions like the message, is just wrong. Uh, Eugene Peterson, his, book, his translation of the message is a total disaster. Uh, for the flesh... The sin nature, that is, sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. So he's describing a uh, experience that only someone who's been regenerated from above knows and that there's a tension that we know that goes far beyond a man's conscience and that we've been regenerated and dwelt by the Holy Spirit so that the Christian who is living in sin, uh, after a season, he's miserable and he feels that tension. The deeds of the flesh, here's what the sin nature produces, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. There's the word sorcery. It's the word pharmakia. And we get our English word pharmacy from it. Now, Drugs uh, are not medicine, we might say, are not forbidden by Scripture. Paul will say to Timothy, take a little wine for your frequent ailments. He was obviously having some kind of gastrointestinal problem. Uh, probably dr- well, He was drinking water only, which could be a problem in the first century. So what did you do? He wasn't advocating the use of strong drink. 
He was advocating what the Mishnah, what the Talmud, what the Didash will expound on in terms of the cultural understanding as you mix your wine with water. He's not talking about distilled alcohol that comes nearly a thousand years after the Bible has been written. And so Timothy needed some wine added to his water. Why? Because there's an ingredient, it's not the alcohol, but there's an ingredient in in wine, in alcohol in general, that kills the bacteria and makes it safe to drink. And so missionaries a hundred years ago carrying that uh, skin, that wine skin around their neck, and they would squirt wine into water to make it safe to drink so they wouldn't get sick. So I'm saying there's a place for medicine. In fact, Paul, when, excuse me, Solomon in Proverbs 31, he mentions strong drink, which would be naturally fermented wine. And he says it's allowable to give to a dying, despairing man. Just like today, we're not uh, giving someone practicing sorcery, so to speak, when we give someone morphine as an act of mercy because they're on their deathbed. We're doing that as an act of kindness. And so there's an allowance for that in Scripture. Where it crosses the line is when it becomes recreational. So someone smokes pot, and let me just say, the marijuana of today, I'm told by experts in the federal government that deals with drug and alcohol uh, issues, is 20 times stronger than the pot that was uh, smoked in the 70s and 80s. And sadly, some of this pot is being laced with other drugs, which has been fatal. We saw all those uh, young men in Florida a year or so ago who thought they were just smoking their quote-unquote weed, and it had fentanyl in it, and uh, I think five of them, if I remember, died. But pharmacia, the use of illicit drugs for what we might call recreational period, uh, uh, recreational use, opens yourself up to a level of evil. People have mind-altering experiences. Why? Because they're opening themselves up to the demonic realm. Now, look, I've not had to deal with demon-possessed people except twice in my whole life in ministry, but you go to other nations of the world, and it's a common place. Uh, in one of the um, entry levels for the demonic realm for sorcery is the illicit use of drugs. And so the connection is clear in the Greek New Testament, pharmakia, sorcery. And actually, if you look at even some of these heavy metal rock bands, you can read their own testimonies, some who even claim to serve and worship Satan, and you read their historical history, their history, you discover that they started with drugs. And that's that's the warning here. So good question. Let's go to the next. All right, Pastor Carl, 843-525-1859. Again, that is 843-525-1859. We're going to go back to the phone lines. I believe we have Bob from Okatee, South Carolina. Good morning, Bob. You are live with Pastor Carl. What is your question? Uh, good morning. My question is on um, Matthew 24, 40, and 41. Yes. Uh, there seems to be a lot of confusion in some of the supplements I get from about the Bible. And, uh, it says two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one taken and the other left. I think a lot of folks believe this is talking about the rapture, and I think it's about the second coming. Uh, I use the Bible Believer's Commentary, and it suggests the second coming. I would like to know what my expert, Dr. Pastor Brogi, has to say. All right. Well, uh, let me respond. I think you're absolutely correct. Context is everything. And so let me just uh, back it up a little bit. Uh, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, interestingly, in the parallel passage in Luke, uh, he, um, again, goes on to some detail that we don't get in Matthew. It's the same sermon on that day. Uh, one who is on the housetop and whose goods are in the house must not go down and take them out. And likewise, the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. So he has just dealt with Noah in his coming. And then he says it was the same in the days of Lot. They were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planning, building, 
But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. So contextually, he's illustrating this truth of one being taken and one being left with Lot and Noah. Uh, Who was left after the great flood? Noah and seven other family members, eight persons in all. And they walked into a brand new world. Who will be left after the second coming? Only believers. Only believers will be left. The rest will be swept away and carried away in judgment. And so the rapture is actually not in Matthew 24. This is the Olivet Discourse that is dealing with the time of the Great Tribulation. You know, again, I I like to be technical, and sometimes people say, well, we're witnessing the birth pangs. We're really not. Now, we're witnessing a pregnancy, but we're not witnessing the birth pangs. The birth pangs don't actually begin until the time of the 70th week of Daniel. And so Daniel gives his 70-week prophecy. By the way, all 70 weeks deal with the nation of Israel. The first 69 weeks deal with the first coming of the Messiah, and then the 70th week deals with the second coming. And very often in the Old Testament, uh, in a single passage or paragraph, both returns of Christ are described. A baby will be born. His name will be called Mighty God. That's his first coming. The governments will rest on his shoulders. That's his second coming, all in the same breath. And so what's in view here in Matthew 24 is the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. And so it's interesting, and I cover this in my series called God's Prophetic Schedule. That might be helpful to some of our listeners. Uh, I also covered it in my series on Revelation. The birth pangs parallel Revelation 6 in the sealed judgments that begin right in the middle of the tribulation. There's an event that happens that 2415 of Matthew speaks of, the abomination of desolation. Again, it fits perfect with the revelation. There's 30 minutes of quiet in heaven. It's like people's breath is taken away and there's total silence. Why? Because the next two sets of judgments are about to unfold. So you have seal, you have trumpets, and you have bulls. The seals are broken one at a time. You can't see all seven seals, but in the seventh seal, you can see all seven trumpets in all seven bull judgments. And when they see what's left, it's just like, wow, it blows them away. And when Jesus comes, because again, that's the context, immediately after the tribulation of those days, verse 29, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the heavens, the power of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. This is the second coming. It's visible. Every eye will see him. Uh, The rapture, well, that happens in the twinkling of an eye. Jesus said, if I go and prepare a place for you all, come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. But uh, there was a a popular uh, eschatological writer by the name of Hal Lindsey, Uh, Hal went to the same seminary I went to, embarrassingly, studied under the same teachers that I studied under. He was there before I was. He's older. He's 90-something, so he's got quite a number of years on me. But he created some turmoil. He used to be a good illustration of some of our homiletic professors of what not to do with the text. So he popularized the meaning in a book that sold Wow. Uh, I think it was one of the best-selling books in all of history. I don't know if that has been surpassed for a long time. Of course, the Bible is the best-selling book. Pilgrim's Progress, I think, was uh, next for generations. But I think it was the late great planet Earth that was the first book to surpass Pilgrim's Progress. And he propagated this error that this is in reference to the rapture. It has nothing to do with the rapture. Two men are in the field. One will be taken. Taken where? They were taken away in judgment. Again, listen to my series, God's Prophetic Schedule. I cover this. I have a whole message on this that I think would be helpful to people. The other will be left. Left for what? Left to enter into the millennial reign of Messiah. Left to enter into a brand new world, just like Noah was left. And he went into a brand new world. Even so, those who are left at the second coming, tribulation saints, the rest are carried away in judgment. Uh, they will enter into a rejuvenated world where the lion will lay down with the wolf and the lamb and the baby will play next to the cobra's nest. And, 
And there's a whole purpose for the millennial reign of Messiah in and of itself. There's a reason he doesn't just have one big comeback event, separate the lost from the saved. There's a whole series of events in the second coming program. So anyway, context is everything. It is everything. And there's an abuse of context when someone makes this represent the rapture because the rapture is not even in view here. Good question. Let's go to the next one. All right, 843-525-1859. Again, that is 843-525-1859 if you have a question on the Bible line this morning. Our next question comes in as a live dictation from Kelly out of Rinkin, Georgia. She writes, when Lazarus and others were brought back to life after they were dead, where did they go? Well, good question. We don't know. We don't know. Um, There is eight people in total. Lazarus, no doubt the most famous because he was dead for four days. Jesus raises three people himself from the dead. The apostle Peter raises some from, from the dead. The apostle Paul raises someone from the dead. So there's five in the New Testament. Elijah the prophet raises someone from the dead. Elisha the prophet raises someone from the dead. And one fellow who is newly dead, he's being buried and he falls on Elijah's grave and he springs back to life. So his death experience was somewhat short. What did God do with those people? Well, they certainly didn't go to heaven because heaven was not yet opened, not as we would describe it today as the Father's house. They went, if they did go somewhere, to Old Testament paradise. Uh, Sheol, Hades is the Greek word for Sheol, and there are two compartments to Hades. There is righteous Hades or righteous Sheol. It's also described as paradisius or paradise or Abraham's bosom. And then there is unrighteous Sheol. At the resurrection, at the ascension, Jesus emptied out uh, righteous Sheol, and it can and everyone in righteous Sheol went to heaven. And that, by the way, still carries the name paradise. And so Paul post-ascension can describe himself as having an experience with paradise, so to speak. And uh, lay that aside. This is why it's good, again, to make sure that when you look at unique examples, especially during the transitory time, say, of the Acts of the Apostles, that you ultimately, not that you can't learn doctrine from the Acts, but you want to make sure that you're interpreting historical books in light of the Epistles. For instance, in Acts 8, you have an example where after someone is actually saved and has received Jesus as Lord, they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, sadly, Roman Catholics use this for the experience of confirmation where the bishop supposedly imparts the Spirit to you. Pentecostals use it as a second work of grace. Um, But again, that's a transitory example, and it's a unique example even within the Acts of the Apostles. There was a reason why. After they had been believed, these they believed that the Samaritans were given the Spirit. But when you come to the epistles, it's clear, say in Ephesians 1, you also have to, having listened to the, uh, the gospel, the message of salvation, having believed, you, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So now the pattern is, is the moment you believe, you receive the Holy Spirit. So we draw our doctrine first and foremost from the epistles. That's kind of the final answer. With that said, these uh, eight individuals were not told where they went. They could have, I suppose, went to righteous Sheol because they were, again, all believers without exception. Um, And if they did, well, that would have been unique, um, but we don't know. I suppose if there were ever to be an example of soul sleep, a false doctrine taught by Seventh-day Adventists, it would be that. Uh, Did the Spirit you know, um, go to Sheol or, you know, again, this is a unique example for me to definitively say one way or the other would be eisegesis that I'm reading into the text, something that's not explicitly said. And again, there's a pattern in the epistles. It's appointed for a man to die once and then comes the judgment. That's the norm. These eight examples are an exception to the norm. And so some might even say that their spirit never even departed the body, so to speak. And in that sense, they were, um, you know, not dead in the traditional sense of today where the spirit. So you, you, people are all over the map on this particular issue. But again, we don't know. But I can tell you what happens today on this side of the ascension. The moment you die, 
your spirit departs and goes home to be with the Lord. Your body's in the grave. As I argued a couple of weeks ago with someone who called in, I say argue, I did, they asked me a question. I defended the point that it appears in Scripture we're given a temporary body in heaven. And so there are people who are tribulation saints who are awaiting their resurrection. That happens at the end of the tribulation with Old Testament saints, according to Revelation 21 through 4, and yet they're wearing white robes. It's got to be hanging on something, but it's not the final resurrection body. Moses and Elijah uh, were meeting with the Lord Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, They certainly didn't go to heaven in their earthly bodies because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This mortality must put on immortality. So if you're thinking, well, Elijah was transported into heaven, well, he was transported up into the sky, probably then immediately went into righteous Sheol or paradise. But nonetheless, they are on the Mount of Transfiguration. They're in some kind of a body, but we know their resurrection hasn't happened yet. Why? Because Daniel 12 The first opening verses of that chapter tells us that the resurrection of Old Testament saints happens at the second coming. Uh, Church saints are raised next at the end of the seven-plus year period. Old Testament saints and tribulation saints are raised. So it's a good question. It's a fair question. You know, how many angels are in the head of a pen, they would ask in the Middle Ages. And, uh, you know, it's one of those interesting questions. And it's good because it causes us to think. Um, but I'm not going to go beyond the bounds of Scripture. Good question. Let's go to the next. All right, Pastor Carl. Our next question comes from Amelia out of Beaufort, South Carolina. She writes, I would love to hear your thoughts on Christians celebrating Halloween. I personally grew up not associating with it at all, and now as a young adult, I feel very convicted that if I have children, they shouldn't participate in it either since it stems from satanic rituals and traditions at the root of the holiday. I'd appreciate anything you have to say about this. Thank you. Well, it's interesting because when you look at this hallowed evening, Halloween, the next day was November the 1st, which is a day in which Roman Catholic people pray for dead folks. When I was a child, that you went to Mass on uh, November the 1st, and you prayed for your dead relatives that were in purgatory. And sometimes they would even offer special masses for a small sum of money, of course, and that name would be put on the altar and the priest would pray over those particular names with the great passion and fervor. With that said, um, Halloween has you know degenerated probably further than when I was a child. If you ask me if I'm in favor of dressing up like the devil and all the evil expressions of Halloween, absolutely not. No way under heaven. If you're asking me if I'm against, say, harvest festivals and kids dressing up as biblical characters, I have no problem with that. If you're asking me, do I believe someone who goes in the door and rings a doorbell, um, some of my grandchildren dressed up as biblical characters, and they're given a a uh, piece of candy that they're receiving an offering from the devil. That's just sheer stupid superstition and somewhat stupidity. Um, but I don't think we should for a moment participate in evil. I do think it could be a good opportunity for Christians when children come to your door to not only give them a nice piece of candy, but a gospel tract. A lot of our families this past year when children came to their door They gave them a piece of candy, and then they invited them to the Harvest Festival, which was the next week. Uh, You say, oh, you hold the Harvest Festival uh, the week after Halloween. Well, actually, we used to hold it the weekend before. Sometimes it would fall on Halloween. Sometimes it wouldn't. Uh, What changed it was daylight savings in that they moved it again into um, from the October-March stance into the November-April stance, which is a good thing for us as pastors because you never have Easter fall on a uh, fall forward Sunday again. Lay that aside, we see it as an opportunity. Look, people can say, you know, worshiping uh, on Christmas Day or having a Christmas Eve service is a pagan holiday that we're celebrating. I see it as an evangelistic opportunity. So this is an issue of personal conscience. And so what I would say to you is that if in your conscience you feel like um, your children shouldn't participate in any way, shape, or form, 
then you have to do that. But you want to be careful here because sometimes kids are brought up in homes where maybe there are some standards that go beyond the bounds of Scripture where you actually have some freedom. And so it might actually be a good teaching tool to say to your children, kids, we don't participate in the evil side of Halloween. But, you know, if you want to go out and have fun and we're going to be with you and protect you and dress up as a biblical character, that would be great. And when someone asks, well, who are you? You can say, well, I'm Nicodemus uh, in the Bible. And someone might say, who is Nicodemus? Well, he's the man that Jesus said, you must be born again to go to heaven. So here, here's a tract. I'll take your candy. Read this if you get a chance. So, so there's some really creative things that you could do, so to speak, on Halloween. So in terms of the evil side, that's not an issue of conscience. That's an issue of biblical standard. In terms of participation on some level, that's an issue of conscience. And if your conscience doesn't give you the freedom, but again, sometimes, you know, you can have what we call a weaker brother. And Paul's goal for the weaker brother to whom we're called to be sensitive to in Romans 14 is for the weaker brother to develop a strong conscience. And sometimes kids grow up in homes and all they see is rules and regulations instead of uh, it all being uh, couched in the context of a love relationship with the living God who saved us and redeemed us. And our goal is to please him and not man. And I'm sure I'm not making any kind of judgment on this caller who has brought this question. We didn't get to it because we're so backed up. We try to answer as many as we can, but I know it's a post-Halloween answer, but maybe it would be helpful to someone for next year. Let's go to the next question. All right, Pastor Carl, uh, I believe we have time for one more. Our next question comes from Jason out of Bluffton, South Carolina. He writes, Acts chapter 8 and verse 37 seems to be omitted in every version of the Bible other than the King's James, King's, King James Version. What are your thoughts on this? Well, it's actually not admitted in every translation of the Bible, so that would be a mischaracterization. So let me respond. For instance... I've just opened my Bible to the New American Standard, and it says, and they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Verse 37, and Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now, there is a difference in the New American Standard in verse 37 and that they put it in brackets, and they do that as a matter of integrity. Let me explain. Uh, They'll indicate in the marginal reading that some later manuscripts, uh, that the early, some early manuscripts do not, in fact, no early manuscripts contain this verse that they can find. Do we have all the early manuscripts? By no means. Uh, We're still finding fragments of the Bible. You think of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were founded, you know, back in 1949. They have found some as recently as a few years ago, fragments of Scripture. So that's been going on for, for, for decades. The largest findings, of course, were in the 80s and 90s where they had a concerted effort to get the scrolls out of various caves. Um, But with that said, does the New American Standard authors, uh, I shouldn't say authors, translators, believe it should be here? Yes. Why? Because they include it in the body of the text. And so if you've ever read uh, translation teams and the things that drive them and so forth, look, there were verses that were contained in some of the manuscripts that the King James used that they didn't include. They skipped over them. Why? Because uh, they didn't believe they were part of the original. This is what's called textual criticism. Textual criticism is not someone ranking on the Bible, but evaluating what was the original 100%. The challenge is we have 101% of the Bible. And textual critics, so to speak, have to ask, what is the original 100%? Why do we even have that challenge? Because with some manuscripts, you have what you call a personal copy. If you open my Bible, you might see on many pages, hundreds of pages throughout it, uh, notes, just observations I've made, and I write it out in the margin and so on. And uh, Well, when you had manuscripts in the early ages, they didn't 
have margins. They wrote from edge to edge. And if you were copying, say, a friend's page of Ephesians 1 and you wanted to copy it word for word and you might even put your own notes in there. Well, the challenge is, is what if someone then copied your copy with your personal notes that aren't distinguished like out in the margin because papyri being so expensive and valuable, they wrote edge to edge. They didn't even put spaces between the words. And so your mind had to supply those. And so therein lies the challenge. But the NASB believes it should be included because, one, the passage doesn't make a lot of sense without it. And number two, um, there's good reason for arguing this, just like in John 5 with the man who's healed at the Pool of Bethesda. If you've heard my sermon on that, I give eight reasons why um, the New American Standard and historically commentators believed it should be included. And one of the things that's helpful sometimes beyond manuscripts, and this can help drive a decision sometimes, is you have what's called the church fathers. You have the early church fathers and the later church fathers. And so sometimes they would write commentaries on the Bible. And if they included it, and you have a church father who lived, say, 175 years after Christ, and they include it in some commentary that they're writing, then they're obviously using some manuscript in which it's contained in which we don't have a copy of. And so that would drive the decision, say, for translators in the NASB and other translations. Now, I don't like it when sometimes to distinguish that it's not in some uh, in early manuscripts, that they put it at the bottom of the page or out in the margin, and all of a sudden the text goes from verse 36 to verse 38. Uh, so, and I cover all this, by the way, in our English Bible. Hey, look, you know, people are King James only people. There's a verse in the book of Jude that the King James left out that affirms the deity of Jesus. Would I say that the King James is an errant translation? I certainly hope not. Oh, they'll say these modern translations took the blood out of it. Look, there's 98 times in which the word blood appears in the New Testament. Um, There's only one verse, one difference in terms of um, the newer translation versus the other. So to say, oh, you know, they took all the verses out that deal with the blood out of the Bible, that's just a, a mischaracterization. That's what we would call a straw man. It is much wiser to build what I call an iron man and to knock that down. And so in the King James, the word blood, heme, appears 98 times. In the New American Standard, it appears 97 times. And the one time it doesn't appear in Colossians 1.14, it appears in the second chapter teaching the identical doctrine. So anyway... Well, we're out of time for today, and thank you for those who've been giving for our WAGP share We're not doing a formal share this year, but if you want to go online and, and give, you can certainly do that. You can go to WAGP.net. You can hit the donation button. It's uh, those who underwrite and those who give on a yearly basis, either a one-time gift or monthly partners that allow all the broadcasters, you hear Search the Scriptures. Now, I pay on Search the Scriptures, other other markets, $12,000, $14,000, $15,000 a year to be on a single station. We don't charge any of the broadcasters anything to be on these stations. So actually, when you support WAGP, you're supporting Alistair Begg, Erwin Lutzer, Adrian Rogers, Charles Stanley, Search the Scriptures with Carl Brogy. You're actually supporting every single ministry. Uh, someone from Alistair's Begg's ministry, they, years ago there would be about 10 people who would come from his church in winter here every year. They're all dead and gone home to be with the Lord. And they always told me how appreciative they were because they worked with Alistair Begg's ministry, that this was a station that did not charge them anything. They said there's so few stations like that. So all I'm trying to say is your support during this month would be very, very much appreciated. Again, go to WAGP.net. If you want to mail in the gift, you can do so. What's the mailing address for WAGP? Uh, it's a P.O. Box, uh, WAGP Seabrook, South Carolina. Pastor Carl, it is the 119 P.O. Box, not 109 anymore. Yeah. So P.O. Box 119. No, it used to be 119. Now it's 130, and 130. it's Buford, South Carolina. That's right. Yeah, so P.O. Box 130, Buford, South Carolina, 29901. Or you can call us here at 843-525-1859. If no one answers, they'll call you back. Again, thank you for 
being involved with us today here at Search the Scriptures. Have a great Thanksgiving with your family.